A remake of Silent Hill 2 was produced and has led to a slew of standard reactions. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it somewhere in between? What does it get right? What does it get wrong? Does the game hold up? Is it a 10 out of 10? Is it a 7 out of 10? Is it average? Is it mediocre? But all these questions are very clinical. They don't really get to the heart of anything, as they boil down the human experience to a set of numbers. How droll. People want the opinions distilled into a little number. It and that's really bad. Please, please, please say it's really bad and point to the complications and point to the, the influence such a construct can have. Please? The nature of this remake being made in the first place and its publication have given me a means to talk about more woke stuff pervading the video game industry and culture in general. In similar fashion as I've addressed the meddling in the affairs of video games by such companies as Sweet Baby Inc., we have a new set of culprits here, Hit Detection LLC, and this guy, Jacob Geller. So let's start off by talking about Silent Hill 2, the original game. The game was released in 2001, and it does not fit within the modern conception of what a video game ought to be. But that's understandable. Silent Hill 2 came out during a time where what a video game was and was not was still in contention, and mild contention at that. The game came out a decade before Roger Ebert ever said video games cannot be art. But gamers who didn't even know they were gamers during the early 2000s were not out and about engaging in any hyper-analytical discussions about what the mechanics in a game were or should have been, and the people who were playing video games at that time were also a lot more patient and more attentive. There was no need to make sure that every element of the game appealed to dwindling attention spans or lack of critical thought. Sometimes I go back and play Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, and I cannot help but think about how slow and methodical it is, compared to a lot of games we have nowadays. In Kodor, you have to wade through multiple dialogue trees and listen to what various characters have to say, all in a grand effort to piece things together and decide what to do next. Such titles allow you to break the galaxy into light and dark, categorize it. Games like Deus Ex and System Shock also functioned that way, and they were released to an audience that was willing to sit down and figure things out, slowly and methodically. These games obviously don't mesh well with an audience who is used to being told what to do and where to go every step of the way. I'm not about to waste half an hour or more doing three of these puzzles that I've already done 15 times before. Why am I still playing this? It's been eight hours already. It's been eight hours, I'm lost, I'm confused, and I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, naturally, this all leads one to the conclusion that re-releasing the game as a remake to a, quote, modern audience was never going to recapture the essence of what Silent Hill 2 was. The artistic value of Silent Hill 2 is necessarily tied to the time in which it was made and the young people, like yours truly, who would have played it. And that's not even a criticism of the remake in particular. It's actually a good thing, because this means that Silent Hill 2 made such a huge impact on the artistic side of the industry that it can't cannot be replicated. That is what uniqueness is. Funnily enough, I mentioned this concept in a video I published a while back concerning the 2020 remake of Digimon Adventure. Twenty years ago, the folks at Bandai and Toei Animation were allotted a singular point in history where they could capitalize on the imaginations of children who were growing up at the turn of the millennium. But those particular sentiments are no longer relevant today. And there I said a remake would never recapture the same feelings of wonderment that the original show had because the people watching it would not be the same people. The original show worked because it was a commentary about the advancement of digital technology and handheld devices. However, nowadays we've made the internet and cellular phones facets of our daily lives. And so that same wonderment that we had in the early 2000s would not exist in 2020. The value that art has is necessarily tied to moments in time, and those moments can be recaptured in memory, but not through technology. For Silent Hill 2, there are things about its presentation, about its art, that cannot and never will be replicated. For example, the vocal performance of Guy Sihi, a man who had gone through his own divorce and, inevitably, brought that into his characterization of James Sunderland. I started uh, weeping as I was reading the lines, and I was oh. visibly shaking. And I think they understood that I could tap into that level of sadness and remorse mm -hmm. at, at will. And it was because of my difficult first marriage I was just coming out of. Guy's performance feels far more real and impactful because of this. 
Mary's gone. She's dead. Liar, that's a lie! No, that's not true. She... she died because she was sick? No, I killed her. Of interest, too, is the fact that the actors in Silent Hill 2 were professional actors, but were also lacking in experience. So the developers hit this sweet spot where they had people who were going to give an awkward performance no matter what they did. And for a world as strange as Silent Hill, this only added to the unsettling aspects about it. Regardless of all that, we know that Silent Hill 2 has become the most renowned game of the Silent Hill series. And what's telling here is that this whole attempt at remaking things for a modern audience, as we are often told, didn't start with the first game. Instead, they started with the second game. This is not an artistic endeavor. It is a means of marketing nostalgia. But that's only the first part. The second part is deconstruction. Practically speaking, the industry could have easily re-released the old game or the remastered version of the old game on a newer system. This way, modern audiences would experience the game as originally intended and laid out by the game's original developers. But that is not the goal of remakes. And so we go back to Jacob Geller. Jacob's website describes him as a writer, a video essayist, a podcast host, and a general art enthusiast. Jacob and the company Hit Detection LLC are credited as being part of the Silent Hill 2 Remake's consultation team. The obvious question here is, why does a game that came out in 2001 need a consultation team today? And the answer to that is postmodernism, or more appropriately, pop postmodernism. And then, more definitively, an attempt at deconstructing the past for the sake of gratifying a current year ideology. As it is commonly used, the word modernity refers to a cultural formation that has risen and become dominant in both Europe and North America, and to some extent in places elsewhere. Modernity is a formation that has been built over the last four centuries. It is characterized by beliefs and styles of thought that aspire to reduce the complexity and evanescence of reality to stable order. Modernity also refers to any institutions that attempt to manage social, economic, religious, and political, and especially religio-political turbulence. It also refers to the scientific practices that seek to map reality in theory, often expressed in mathematical terms, and to manage and improve nature through technology. It refers to the civilization in which metaphors of machinery and factory move from the technological and economic spheres to guide political programs, architectural styles, and conceptions of the human being. It refers to the belief that human beings, at least certain human beings, despite the failures of the past, can actually achieve a semi-divine control over the world. Ultimately, modernity is the name of a social, cultural, and political apparatus that, since the 17th and 18th centuries, has inspired Europeans and North Americans to aspire to control vapor, to sculpt the mist, to rein in the energies unfortunately unleashed by the Renaissance and a century of religious war. And before one has even gotten through digesting all of that, we then try to discover what postmodernism is. Well, postmodernism is what happens next. Where are we going with all this? The postmodernist believes he can discern what secret things lie beyond the sun. These days, the postmodernist can be seen in various realms attempting to subvert and destroy. And the current lingo we use to refer to these kinds of people is woke. The postmodernist is naturally a skeptic. Simultaneously, he believes in nothing, but at the same time, he believes in everything. For the postmodernist, entertainment exists as a means of conquering culture, and art exists as a means of plumbing the carnal nature of humanity in a grand attempt to search for ever new sensations and experiences. Meanwhile, politics is just a theatrical stage performance that throws a blanket over the projection and use of power. And society is an artificial construct. Meanwhile, anything that contains true value and substance must be deconstructed and ultimately destroyed. And this is where people like Jacob Geller come in. Jacob has a video entitled, Who's Afraid of Modern Art? Colon, Vandalism, Video Games, and Fascism. This video more or less tells you all you need to know about what Jacob believes in. 
For the sake of brevity, I won't go into it in any great detail, but I will highlight a few things which I believe will form an adequate picture in your mind of Jacob's Caliber. Depression Quest isn't a new kind of game. Text-based adventures have been around forever, targeted harassment campaigns at its creator ever since it released. Mark Rothko's work doesn't fit very well with the typical adjectives we use to describe art. It's red and brown and chunky stripes on an absolutely enormous canvas. Hoo hoo, boy, does it make me feel. But Rothko's work, despite its acclaim, is still subversive. My favorite of his works, and probably his most famous, is of a plastic crucifix submerged in his own urine. It's titled Piss Christ. Reducing art to a linear connection between skill and value fundamentally just turns art into a commodity. Art is the most damn subjective thing there is. I am not about to tell you that not liking modern art makes you fascist. However, when, for instance, every artist that the dominant ideology values for the last thousand years has been a white guy and creates things that glorify white and colonialist ideals, one place we might see those political motivations is, uh... Nazis. 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 Hoo-hoo, boy, does it make me feel. Modern art is a misnomer. Much of modern art is not modern. Rather, it is stuff that has been made by people who are attempting to subvert and overturn real established aesthetic value. It is pop postmodern art, and cannot even be described as art anyway because the definition of the word itself must also necessarily be questioned by this supposed art form. Jacob's entire philosophy is built on the want to destroy, not to create, and there are comments that he has made on Twitter which can be taken as evidence of that as well. Now if I am to be charitable to Jacob here, I do know what that intent is, to bring about some woke utopia. Jacob is only doing what many within the postmodern realm have been taught to do, bring about the new but destroy the past. As a greater example of what I'm talking about, what was the first thing that Disney did when they created the sequel trilogy to Star Wars? Well we know that Han and Leia are divorced and their only child is estranged. And these things are a reversal of the Star Wars Legends canonicity, which was established established in the 1990s. We also know that Luke Skywalker has banished himself, and his successor is a woman. All these things a subversion, a reversal. And they're all done because the past needs to die because it supports the present. Let the past die. Kill it, if you have to. That's the only way to become what you were meant to be. Traditional norms are the basis for true modernity, but there are things in the past that are left unreconciled. So what do artists do? Well, some ideologues passing themselves off as artists have sought to bring about a postmodern state. Since the past is the only thing holding us back from reaching that utopian ideal, the past and everything that has been established by it must be eradicated in some way. The past is scary. It's full of war, slavery, sickness, starvation, and death. Obviously, all things which we would prefer to avoid and not have to deal with. Yet within a godless society, we would like to conceive of some kind of intellectual system as a means of dealing with pain and suffering in the here and now and reconciling with the sins of the past. A godless society does not acknowledge that we already have a heroic figure who has already taken on the sins of the past, present, and the future. For people like Jacob, the sins of the past are appropriated with the term fascism. But what is fascism? The way he and others of his caliber use this word does not attend to its original definition. Instead, the word is used to describe anyone who finds more value in reconciling with the past than they do with attending to an imaginary future built on intellectual systems and modern technology. Now, whenever I talk about wokeness in media, I'm not just referring to left-wing propaganda, although that is a huge part of it. But when I use the term woke, I refer to something that is far more encompassing and refers to ideologies guided by postmodernism, or pop postmodernism. And that may not even be relegated specifically to socialist or communist types of people, but often is because those ideals are also about overturning traditional norms for the sake of securing this utopian future. A bedrock to actual postmodernism would be found in the works of French philosopher Jacques Derrida or French historian Michel Foucault. But Derrida and Foucault at least did not throw the baby out with the bathwater when they talk about their ideals. Pop postmodernism, on the other hand, is cultish and destructive. 
I was informed about a lot of these things after listening to and reading the works of Peter J. Lightheart, American author, minister, and theologian who serves as president of Theopolis Institute for Biblical, Liturgical, and Cultural Studies in Birmingham, Alabama. The, the modern world is founded basically on a, on a boundary that's drawn by modern people between primitive them and the mature and up-to-date us. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sacred boundary, as it were, drawn in time. Every, everyone outside that boundary is, um, is profane. Everyone outside that boundary is primitive. Um, some of those primitive peoples coexist with us in time. We can find tribes that are not modern, but they're on the other side of their boundary. That's them, and we're us. We're on the right side of history. For example, we don't want their way of life to infiltrate ours. Their way of life is religiously formed. We don't want that to infiltrate our way of life. We don't want our way of life to be, uh, as moderns, we don't our way, want our way of life to be uh, formed and molded by religious concerns. We want to be, have it free. We want to maintain this sacred boundary between the way of life that we have and the way of life that they used to have. Lightheart has a very interesting book about Dungeons and Dragons, by the way. But that's only peripherally relevant to this topic, given Lightheart talks about the concept of vocations there. To the point, the categories that Lightheart has used to explain postmodernism come from the book of Ecclesiastes in the Hebrew Bible. When we think of both modernity and postmodernity, we should think of King Solomon's image of the world as vapor. Everything is vapor. And every man-made achievement is just a means of shepherding wind. A metaphor for our lack of control. Modernity is Lightheart describes describes it is a collection of cultural, institutional, and political structures that, for the past several centuries, have attempted to bring both technical and political control to the world through various means. The goal being to reduce everything to an intellectual system. While modernity is an effort to shepherd wind, post-modernity is the recognition that this entire project of controlling reality through technology and intellect has been far from successful. There are gaps in every human theory left unaccounted for, and those gaps reveal that human knowledge is not as global and totalizing as modernists tend to believe it is. And by the way, this is even where we develop the concept of deus ex machina, God out of the machine. Because writers cannot account for the concise occurrence of all things within a story, they therefore leave it to God to resolve everything in the end. But postmodernity is an effort to reconcile the failures and incompletion of modernity. With that in mind, postmodernity is not inherently corrupt in its machinations because there are problems with modernity that ought to be addressed, and there ought to be established venues for that. Venues that do not seek to destroy, but to create. But instead, what we are encountering right now within the woke sphere of political and social meddling is something that Lightheart describes as pop postmodernism. While there are serious thinkers within the postmodern realm, like Derrida and Foucault, many ideas have gotten filtered down to the popular level, where various ideological tenets have been shook loose. And this is what we describe as wokeism. Wokeism is a knee-jerk relativism that refuses to acknowledge any absolute standards or any final truth. Take that as your definition going forward. Wokeness is manifested by anyone who tries to tell us there are no such things as better or worse aesthetically, and so is an attempt to reverse and subvert traditional norms. One of the key aspects of wokeness, which is widely recognized, is the uglification of various characters in media. And we can even see this in some of the character designs in the Silent Hill 2 remake. Speaking of elephants in the room, we have to talk about the ugly women in this game. Yes, the women were blatantly made more ugly in this game on purpose. Angela is the most obvious example. She had the biggest character assassination in this game next to Eddie. And I think a big part of that is genuinely making her look like a man. Everyone who's seen the new version of the mirror scene, you know that's a fucking man, dude. Just look at that face. That is not an ugly woman. That is an adult male. These new character designs are a calculated deconstruction of aesthetics which have, traditionally, been visually pleasing to the eye. As a consultation group, I guarantee this is the kind of stuff that Jacob Geller was involved in, just based on his video essays. And this is why the remake hired him as a consultant. There was no grand effort to improve on the product, but to deconstruct it as a means of waging culture war on unassuming gamers who otherwise think that they're playing an aesthetically improved version of a game that came out over 20 years ago. The Halo effect is absolutely real. If this character is hideous, and she didn't used to be hideous in the original game, she was just an average looking woman, 
woman, then I'm obviously going to be less sympathetic toward the character. Another reason a lot of people within the gaming community have been made aware this is being done on purpose is because it was self-reported by the company Dove USA. Yes, the one that sells soap and other personal care products. There are thousands of skins available to choose from. But finally, one that looks like mine. But regardless of self-reporting, we can all see it for what it is. And it all helps explain why there is indeed a culture war pivot on aesthetic appeal and design. The push for a change in aesthetic design is obvious and egregious, easily spotted in such games as Horizon Zero Dawn, Spider-Man 2, or Star Wars Outlaws. In the Silent Hill 2 remake, the changes are just as obvious. And again, based on the involvement of Hit Detection LLC, these changes are definitely part of an ongoing deconstruction of objectively good aesthetics. And by the way, the main reason anyone will deny this is going on is because they would otherwise have to address the ideological angle as to why this is even being done in the first place. So if you're one of these it's not happening people, you are entitled to just turn your brain off, stop noticing things, and enjoy your pig slop. Or as Synthetic Man often puts it, just turn off the pattern recognition part of your brain. But just be aware that you will also be recognized as a patsy for people who hate the medium you pretend to enjoy. Just another tool for the postmodern state in its ever-changing current year ideology. Now, what is remarkable about Silent Hill 2 is the game did lend itself to a postmodernist attempt at deconstructing what true beauty is. What with James Sunderland's essentially being caught between two versions of his wife. Not to mention the symbolism of the nurse monsters. But these are concepts which fall apart if one no longer believes in objectively good or bad aesthetics. And so the remake will not appeal to modern audiences in the same manner as the original game did. Anyone who insists on a standard of beauty in the world would also be drawing from something substantial, and that would be regardless of whether they realize what that substance is. It is something that may be difficult to describe, but can be described, and historically has been described, through words like exquisite, perfect, divine. But we also do this through poetry, through song, and through paintings. For a postmodern relativist, however, beauty must be questioned, subverted, and ultimately discarded. Denial of truth and perpetuating an existence under the thumb of this pop postmodernist ideology has placed everyone in a state of perpetual irony. And ultimately, we will be rendered unable to tell the truth if we deny ourselves the ability to make such distinctions as beautiful and ugly. Yet our current world would bid us lie to each other and lie to ourselves, and to always question everything. As such, everything becomes very artificial, and the internet, or social media, only lends itself to that ongoing delusion. Peter Lightheart explains that we are conscious of how artificial a lot of aspects of our lives are. If we are unable to acknowledge the unattractive things in our world, the damaged things, the broken things, then how will we know how to fix them? How will we know how to make them good and beautiful again? What is even the point of living if not to make the world around us all the more glamorous and alluring? Anyway, the overall purpose and the whole point of talking about all of this is that after we have destroyed the old concepts of beauty and ugliness, somehow we will arrive at something entirely new and unthought of by our current psyches. And that is the ultimate goal, enlightenment. Our third eye will somehow be opened, and until then, we just need to fill all our media with black lesbians and tr- <laughs> Incidentally, this is also why people are constantly led down rabbit holes of more and more pernicious forms of or other forms of addiction. The desire is to see and to experience something new, something that has not been experienced before, because once you've seen and experienced one thing, that and everything like it becomes stale and stagnant. But that's just like these remakes, isn't it? The corporations that regularly produce our slop have some peripheral understanding about our cultural dilemma, enough that they readily exploit it. Rather than fight the current cultural degradation, these corporations continually develop new ways of marketing marketing classical cultural experiences to us in the present. And this is all a grand attempt to peek beyond the sun, to leave us with the false promise of something original, something new. And what does that turn into? Vanity projects like turning all white men black, female, and gay. This is all a very short road leading nowhere, and I'm not certain as to how long things will remain this way. Not forever, of course. But what I do know is that as we get older and wiser, what will become more and more apparent to us is that there is indeed nothing new under the sun.